All right, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the um, analysis behind some of the games. And so we're going to go back to the game that had one big pile, and you could take up to twice as many. We, were, we ended up calling them pebbles. So we had one pile of pebbles. Uh, you could take up to twice as many as the previous player had taken. Um, so whatever they took on their turn, you can take up to twice as many as that. And you can't. the player one can't take all of the pebbles on the first move. And a winner is whoever picks up the last pebble. All right, so we had played this game. We had looked at it. Uh, we played for a little while. Maybe try to figure out some places that you wanted to be and some places that you didn't want to be on your turn. But we didn't go into a lot of detail about it because I told you at the time that we didn't quite have all of the uh, mathematical pieces uh, in order to, to completely analyze this. Okay, so what happens? On your turn, what do you want to see? At the end of the game, what would you like to see? One. You would like to see one, or one or two. One or two would be fine, because if there are two left, you know they took at least one. You could take both of them. If there's one left, it doesn't matter how many they took. They took at least one, and you can take the last one. So one or two would be good for you, right? If you see that on your turn, that's a... What did we call that? A next player, an in position. What if there are three left? Could go either way. Depends on how many was taken before. Depends on how many was were taken before, right? So if there are three left. What do you want them to have done? You want them to have taken at least two. So if there were three left, you want them to have taken at least two to get it to three, but what are they not going to do? They're never going to take two to get it to three. Right? So we start considering, okay, what can happen? What do we want to avoid? And we immediately run into a situation that if we get here, then I mean, this isn't going to happen for us. Right? The only way we're going to have three left is if there were four at the move before. Is that three left on our turn or your turn? Because Just if, we, if, if it's our turn and we see three left, okay. right? If we see three left, they're only going to leave three if... They took one from four. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we can start this whole process, though, this, this backwards induction kind of process that, we, that we've that we used in the other games to try to figure out what's going to happen and what do you want to do and what do you not want to do. You would like to leave three for them if you only got there from four. But you won't leave three for them from any other position. Same with them. They're only going to leave three if they got there by taking one away from four. So we start going backward, backward, and, and so on. So will there ever be four left? Nobody will ever leave four because 
the other player could just take one and leave three and win, right? So you never leave, leave four because you're going to lose if you do that. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's look at this from a, well, let's not even look at this. Let's look at something that looks completely unrelated that turns out to be exactly what we need, right? So, um, so what we're going to do is completely shift gears to talk about Fibonacci numbers for a minute. Okay, so what are Fibonacci numbers? Fibonacci numbers are a sequence of numbers that start with one. The next one is one. And actually, we can start the, the formula here, but the next one is 2. And after that, we add 2 together to get the next one, and then those the last 2 to get the one after that, and those last 2 to get the one after that, and so on. So the sequence is 1, 1, 2. What would come next? Three, three five, five, eight, thirteen, twenty-one, thirty-four. This keeps going forever. Okay, now Fibonacci numbers are. There's a lot of information about them. There's some things that uh, have been kind of created as as legend that aren't necessarily true. Um, the person uh, that these are named after lived in the 12th century, I think it was. The, the, the year 1182 comes to mind. I can't remember exactly what's important about that year. Um, but the original version of this was in terms of, uh, of rabbit populations. So you would have rabbits that after um, they had to mature, so after one month they could mature, they would mature and start breeding. And so if you started with one pair of rabbits after one month, you still have one pair of rabbits. But then they would start breeding, and you would have more and more and more rabbits um, as, as time goes on. We're going to see some other problems where these numbers come into play quite a bit. Uh, Why are the first two one? Well, so if you have a pair of rabbits, and they take a month before they can mature to start breeding, after one month, you're still going to have one pair of rabbits. And then you start getting offspring after that. Um, so the idea is with these two starting values, then everything after that is just a sum of the two previous. So what can you also do? There are other sequences of numbers that follow this same kind of rule, the same kind of situation, except rather than starting with 1-1, one, one, they start with some other starting values. Start with different starting values, you get different sequences. Same kinds of ideas, so these are called Fibonacci-like sequences. Sometimes, rather than just having these numbers added together, you might have a different starting values and maybe coefficients on those terms. And I think we saw an example of something like that um, in another problem recently, but that might have been in a different class, I don't remember. Um, something that came up in, in, that we were looking at that had a Fibonacci-like uh, aspect to it. So what's happening? There are variations on the theme, but the Fibonacci numbers um, have shown up in lots of different places. In some cases, they show up just because it's kind of an accidental thing, the fact that there are small numbers, and we talked about the patterns, um, not enough patterns for the number of small numbers, but sometimes these patterns are, are legitimate and the Fibonacci numbers uh, really do show up in a lot of different applications. Okay, so we can use this idea of Fibonacci numbers to describe other numbers. 
again, the Fibonacci numbers, it might have been 1282. I'm just, the numbers are popping into my mind. I don't remember exact years. I should have, I should have looked that up. I, anyway, um, somebody's going to check that really quickly on Wikipedia, right? Um, so, these numbers can be used to describe any positive integer that we want to. So in the 1939, uh, there was a, um, an amateur Belgian mathematician by the name of Zuckendorf. And Zuckendorf um, <laughs> came up with a, or found a, um, a connection between Fibonacci numbers and other, and other numbers. At least that's the, the, the story that was going around. Uh, there's always, you know, the, the historical things that happen. Um, he didn't write a paper on it until the 70s, and somebody else had already written a paper in the 1950s about it. But it was already being called a Zeckendorf representation of a number, so he probably was the one that came up with it. Um, and so anyway, we'll talk about this, and we'll call it a Zeckendorf representation of a number. And so here's the idea. If we have any particular number, any, any positive integer n, We can describe that number in terms of Fibonacci numbers by basically creating a binary string that matches against the Fibonacci numbers. And so, for instance, kind of creating this like we do um, a binary representation of a number. You put a 1 if that number is part of it, and a 0 if it's not. And so the idea is we leave off the, the 0 position, and we're just going to have a binary string that starts here. And so in general, we could say, all right, let's write down a number. Um, if I write down this, what number would that correspond to? Well, that would mean a 1, a 3, and a 5. And that would be the number 9. Does that make sense? You're saying one of these, none of those, one of those, and one of those. Add those together. 1 plus 3 plus 5 is 9. All right, so it works like the binary numbers. If you have a 1 in there, you have that, that power of 2 in the sum. And if you have a 0, you don't have that power of 2. Well, this isn't the way we actually end up using this, this situation for representation, because when we write down a number, if, we, if you look at this, you could also write 9 like that. A 1 and an 8. And so if we're going to use this kind of description, uh, this kind of Fibonacci representation of a number, we want there to be one way to write a number. You don't want there to be a bunch of different ways to write the same number. Why do we not want a bunch of different ways to write the same number? Because when we're trying to decode, right, it's, it's more confusing than it would be if there were a single specific way. All right, so what Zeckendorf noticed, apparently, was that we can... Call this Zeckendorf's theorem. We won't call it that. That's what people call it. So we'll agree with them. Someone made that up. His name was that? Edward Edward Zeckendorf. No. Um, so I guess his parents made that up. Yeah, okay. So every positive integer. can be uniquely represented. Now what does, well we'll talk about that in just a second. 
positive integer can be uniquely represented as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So we're going to write this in a couple of different ways and do some exploration of this and see what, what this means. Okay, so what does uniquely represented mean? It means there's going to be one way to do it. Not only one way, the fact that it can be represented, there's exactly one way. Right? So every number can be represented this way, and it will be represented exactly one way as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. Now, what does that correspond to with our encoding idea? What does it mean if they're non-consecutive? What do you never have in this binary representation? You never have two ones side by side, right? So they're non-consecutive values. So this will turn out to be the only way you can write the number nine without ever having any ones side by side. All right, now, one fairly simple sentence. Uh, there's a lot of work to prove this. We're going to do some exploration uh, of, of what's going on here and what happens. But let's pick a number. Let's say the number 17. Can we write down the number 17 so that it is a sum of non-consecutive distinct Fibonacci numbers? So we're leaving off that first one. We're not going to use ones twice. Um, so can we write down 17? Yeah, so 17. is 1 plus 3 plus 13, which if we were writing it in this binary uh, uh, string, there's a 1, there's not a 2, there's a 3, no 5 or 8, and a 13 would look like, would look like this. Okay, so 17, 1 plus 3 plus 13. Are there other ways to write 17? Yeah, 17 is also 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 8, I think, right? Um, yeah, but that's not this kind of representation. Right? This particular approach from Zeckendorf um, that we will then call the Zeckendorf representation of the number. And with the Zeckendorf representation, we either list the sum of Fibonacci numbers or we write down that binary string and we'll use those kind of interchangeably. Okay, so we could be more formal with this statement and, and describe that binary string and talk about what's happening. Uh, what would happen um, given, so this is the equivalent version of that. Right. Given the Fibonacci sequence So the Fibonacci sequence has these two starting values, 1 and 2. And then after that, everything is a sum of the previous two. And any positive integer n. string that we can represent maybe as a 
v1, v2, all the way up to some, some value bt. T is at least one, so that means it's a non-empty string as well. So this much longer sentence seems more uh, involved, but really is just making a connection to that binary representation of, the, of this number. Um, what is this summation really saying? If there's a one there, we're adding in that Fibonacci number. And if there's a zero in the sequence, we're not adding in that Fibonacci number. And there are no ones side by side. So we're doing the same thing, a sum of, of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. All right, so it says exactly the same thing. Well, what's the benefit of this longer explanation that maybe we can utilize this summation to recognize some patterns or do something uh, with, with the value? Um, maybe, maybe in terms of a proof, it's easier to work with something that has more detail like this does. And maybe not, right? It, goes, it can go both ways. All right, so what happens here? Uh, Zeckendorf's theorem says that every positive integer can be uniquely represented as a sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So what do we want to be able to do? If we're going to prove this, we have to prove that every positive integer can be represented in that way. And then once it's represented in that way, prove that that's a unique representation. So there's two parts to a proof. But we can also experiment and explore a little bit to find out what kinds of, of um, patterns can happen. So does the statement make sense? We have no reason to believe that it's true other than the fact that we're talking about it here and have given it the name theorem. Um, but we can start experimenting with these values in the Fibonacci numbers adding pieces together and see what happens. So before we start looking at, the, at, a, at a proof for this theorem, let's do some experimentation. Again, just some of the values from the Fibonacci sequence. What happens if we get, say, a sequence like this? What number is that? 12. That's 12. Right? OK, what number is, I guess we should have started. Back here, what number is that? Let's 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 turn these around. Uh, is it supposed to be like one before the thing that precedes? Like twelve is one less than thirteen, four is one less than five. And if we were back here. So this is one, which is one less than two. This sum is four, which is one less than five. This sum is twelve, which is one less than thirteen. What happens if we went on? There's 12 plus 21, which is 33, which is one less than that. All right, so what does this look like? It looks like, just, just based on this rather small amount of data, that adding all of the Fibonacci numbers 
in odd positions up to some particular point. is equal to what? Looks like it's one less in the next position. than the Fibonacci number in the next position. Okay, now we haven't proved that. It's just based on four data points. Are these representations, are they these Zeckendorf representations? Yeah. Yeah, they don't have consecutive ones, right? So what happens if you have this number and then you want to go to the next number? Does the next number also have a Zeckendorf representation? What do you mean the next number? So the, the, this number was 33. The next number would be 34. Yeah, the next number would be all zeros with a 1 in that spot, right? So 33 has a Zeckendorf representation, and 34 has one as well. Right? So you have one number that has a representation, the next one does. But this is not what all representations look like. We saw that 17 had other gaps in there, right? All right, let's take a look. At, we could we could try to write this down in a um, in a more mathematical way. But what do we have to look at? We would have to look at the odd positions, making sure that we're adding in the odd positions, and then coming up with uh, the statement. We'll we'll do that in a little bit. Let's do the same idea. But this time, let's put the ones in the even slots. What happens here? It's two, which is one less than, than this. What if we came out here? Seven, which is one less than the next number, which is eight. This one is 20, one less than 21. Keep going. Fifty-four. Fifty-four, which is one less than 55. And so what's happening here is if you add up the Fibonacci numbers in the even positions, you also get one less than the Fibonacci number that's in the next slot after that. All right, so there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of structure like this in the Fibonacci numbers. We can partially use this uh, in terms of, of coming up with a, a, a proof of Zeckendorf's theorem, but we'll, we'll do this in a different way. Um, but, but this fact that there's these patterns that are here, um, well, there's just, there's other stuff, right? This very simple definition of the Fibonacci numbers leads to lots of, of interplay, a lot of, of uh, the surprising or unexpected things that happen. Okay, so let's see if we can try to prove Zeckendorf's theorem. Before we start proving Zeckendorf's theorem, we might say something like, the Zeckendorf representation of a number. So using a notation like that, the Zeckendorf rep representation of the number. And maybe that will be the sum of those, of those values. So for instance, the Zeckendorf representation of 7 is... 0, 1, 0, 1. Or instead of that way, maybe we will say that the Zeckendorf representation is 
2 plus 5. So depending on what we're, what we're going to do, um, in, the way we're, in the way we're going to prove this in the notation, uh, maybe we'll think of it this way as, as better instead of, instead of as the, the binary representation. So we can switch back and forth between those two, right? So we get this kind of this kind of encoding of a number or this kind of encoding of the number. All right, so again, second Deutsch theorem. Every positive integer can be uniquely represented as the sum of distinct non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. I can barely read that. I'm sure you can't read that either. I apologize. <laughs> um, let's see what a proof needs to look like. First of all, in the proof, we need to be able to show that a positive integer can be represented in this way. All right. So, how would we prove that a number can be written in that way? So we have this first claim, claim number one. That every integer, I'm implying every positive integer, so every positive integer can be written in this way is our, is our first claim. What proofs techniques do we have that we might use to prove a statement about every integer. Induction. Induction, right? Induction seems to be really useful if you can prove something for one number and somehow make the connection to the next number. Uh, then it works for one, so it works for the next one. It does work for the starting values, and so it works for every number after that. So let's see what the base case might look like. So for the base case, well, let's see. Starting with 1, can 1 be written in this way? Yeah. Yes. What about 2? Yeah. 1, 2, and 3 are all Fibonacci numbers. So they can automatically be written this way. What about 4? 1 and 3. 4 is 1 plus 3. OK, so we have the first three positive integers are all Fibonacci numbers. They're automatically written in this way just by writing down that number. Um, as the sum, in this case, the sum is just a single number by itself. Feels a little shaky, so the sum really kind of needs two values. And so we have this in place. So what's going to happen if you have a Fibonacci number its representation in this way is just the Fibonacci number. If we have something that's not a Fibonacci number like 4, OK, we have a starting point. So with the base case in, in this, 1 and 2 are already given, right? So is our base case 3? Because we're, with Fibonacci number, you start with 1 and 2. And they're at least in this case, we're starting with 1 and 2. Well, but 1 plus 2 is not the representation of 3. Because yeah. 3 is itself a Fibonacci number. So we're starting 
the, the base case idea is the numbers themselves, just the integers. Okay. One, two, three, four. The Fibonacci numbers are separate. We've already calculated those, or we already know what they are. Uh, we may not have listed all of them. We can't list all of them, uh, but we know what they already are. And so we're comparing these numbers to that list of Fibonacci numbers to see, is there a way to represent this number according to this sum of non-consecutive values? So, one, so, so the idea is that Fibonacci numbers, we're going to accept their representation of just, as just being the Fibonacci number itself. So 4 is the first non-Fibonacci number, and we can represent it as a sum of 1 and 3. Did that answer your question as well? Yes. Okay. So our unique representation, if we run into a Fibonacci number, we're just going to write it down by itself. That's our representation. The only way we can write that number in this non-consecutive way. All right? Otherwise, how do you get a Fibonacci number? You have to add the two previous ones together, and they're side by side. So that's not non-consecutive. Four is really our base case in this sense. So if one, two, and three, that's not a part of the base case? Well, one, two, and three are kind of part of the base case, but they're really more in the idea of what do you do when the number's already a Fibonacci number? Okay. So what do you do when it's already a Fibonacci number? We write that down by itself. Now we have this separate situation of if the number is not a Fibonacci number. So really, this is, this is our base case of the parts that we have to prove anything about. But we also uh, need to look at, at how you can go from one uh, value then to the next, right? So what is... Uh, what is the, the approach here? We're going to have to use a slightly different version of the inductive claim. And so there's a, there are two versions of induction. Uh, there's one that, just, that, that we've used uh, most that just says, if something's true for one number, and then, it's, then we prove that it's true for the very next one, in this situation, we're going to make our assumption that it's not just true for one number, but that it's true for every number up to that point. So what do we have really in this approach? All of these are part of the base case. What do we know? We know that this claim is true for every number from 1 up through 4. And we might need to use all of that information to go to the next number. Then, well, what do we also know? We know that it's true for 5, because 5 is back to being a Fibonacci number. So we might need to use everything from 1 to 5 in order to be able to prove that it's true for 6. Then for 7, use everything from 1 to 6 in order to get 7. But we only have to do this one time. right? So in this case, our inductive claim... we need to try to prove would be um, if every positive integer let's say some a less than up to some k, 
try to prove is that if every number up to some value has a Zeckendorf representation, then the next number has one as well. Okay. All right. So let's outline a proof of this little subpart of our overall um, theorem here. All right, so if So if K is a Fibonacci number, then we're done. It has, a, it has a Zeckendorf representation. Just write it down by itself. So what if K is not a Fibonacci number? This is the part that we So K is not a Fibonacci number. All right, so if it's not a Fibonacci number, what does that mean? That means that K is between two Fibonacci numbers. So there's some Fibonacci number, say, F sub J, that is less than K, and there's another one that is bigger than K. Does that make sense? If it's not a Fibonacci number, then it's between two Fibonacci numbers. So let's let D, the distance, represent how far above that Fibonacci number K actually is. So K minus F sub J. So we have a Fibonacci number here, we have k, and then we have some other Fibonacci number over there. And this distance right here is d. All right, now let's see what we can say about D. Since K is less than F sub J plus 1, right, the J plus first Fibonacci number, we know that D is less than that distance. Does that make sense? This number is smaller than that one. So if we put the bigger number in there, then this is going to be a bigger number. This difference will be even bigger. So this will be this will be bigger than D. What do we know about a Fibonacci number minus the previous Fibonacci number? What's that going to be equal to? The one before that. The Fibonacci number right before that. Right? So this is going to be D will be less than the Fibonacci number that came even before that. So we have this Fibonacci number, this Fibonacci number. K is in here somewhere. There's a Fibonacci number back here, wherever it happens to be. 
and D is somewhere over here. Okay. Now, D is smaller than K. So from our inductive claim that we're proving, or that we're trying to prove here, what are we assuming? We're assuming that D has a second dwarf representation. What do we know about that representation? What does it not include? It doesn't include any numbers that are bigger than D. So the second dwarf representation of D does not include F sub J minus 1. All right. Does that make sense? Uh, where did you the F of J minus one and the from the D less than that? Like? So what is F of some J plus one? It's add the, these two previous values together to get that one. That's how we get that's how we get Fibonacci numbers, right? Yeah. You add two previous values to get the next one. So what do we say when you take one and subtract the one before it, you get the Fibonacci number even before that? Okay. All right, so this comes from, from, from here. Why is it important to distinguish that D is not going to include F of J minus 1? Okay, let's take a look at what happens. What do we know about... D. D is K minus F sub J. Right? There's a second dwarf representation here. So let, let's let's see what this means. This means that K is equal to D plus F sub J. Right? Now, we have a second dwarf representation for D. But what does it not include? It doesn't include the Fibonacci number that comes right before this one. F sub J minus 1 is the Fibonacci number right before that one. So what can we do to get a second dwarf representation for K? We can use the second dwarf representation for D and add f sub j to it. Why do we know this works? Because the last Fibonacci number before this one is not in, in here. And so there's a gap. We have space to be able to add this one on to create our representation. Does that make any sense? Okay, so what's going to happen? Are we okay down to D being less than that previous Fibonacci number? Mm -hmm. And so D is less than K, so it has some Fibonacci representation, or Zeckendorf representation. Do you agree that since the number is less than that Fibonacci number, that it cannot include that Fibonacci number in its, mm -hmm. in its sum? Okay, so what's going to happen? Again, if we're thinking of the slots that are filled, here is the slot 
for f sub j. We would like to include that value in our representation for k. Right? And as far as the binary version goes, we want a 1 right there. But in order to have a 1 right there, what do we have to be able to prove? We have to be able to prove that there's a 0 right here. Because if there's a 1 right there, we can't include f sub j. But what do we know? We know that the Zeckendorf representation, the binary version for d, has a 0 right there. It does not include the previous, this is the f sub j minus 1 slot, the Zeckendorf representation for d does not include that Fibonacci number. So the representation for d will only have 1s and zeros otherwise. It will have 1s over here somewhere, but it will not have any consecutive 1s. And then when we get to k, we still won't have consecutive ones because there's a zero there, and then we put the one in that slot. Does that make any sense? That makes more sense. And then we know that f sub j is going to have a one because k is greater than f sub j. So yeah, k is k is equal to this. So if we can get a representation for d that has an empty slot right there, then we can add f sub j in. If for some reason d didn't have an empty slot right there, we couldn't add f sub j, and that would be a problem. Okay, but what's going to happen? Any number you want, you can find out how far it is from the previous Fibonacci number. Find the Zeckendorf representation for that number, and then create the Zeckendorf representation for the number that you that you care about. Does that make sense? So let's see how this works. Okay, this is this is actually the end of the inductive proof um, because we've shown that if you have everything up to that point, then that one has a representation as well. We know that you have a representation for one up to four. That gives us a representation a representation for five. How would we get the representation for six? Let's see what happens. We have representations for the numbers up 1 up to 5. So 6 is the number we care about now. This is our k. All right, so 6 is between 5 and 8. So what is d? 1. d is 1. So we're saying that the Zeckendorf representation for 6 is going to be equal to the Ze Zeckendorf representation for 1 plus this Fibonacci number, 5. Well, what is the Zeckendorf representation for 1? It's 1. And so 6 is 1 plus 5. But there was a hand. Uh, you can keep going. It's okay. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Let's try a bigger number. Let's try k equals 18. All right, what numbers, uh, what Fibonacci numbers? 13 to 21. Between 13 and 21. So what is d? D is 18 minus 13, which is 5. Second dwarf representation for 5 is 5. And so what do we have? Just the number itself, 18, is 5 plus 13. If we wanted to write this in the binary approach, we would have to account for all where all the zeros are and so on in between, right? Where the ones and the zeros in the representation before. So 18 is 5 plus 13. Okay, let's go with a much bigger number. 
is 81. So what is 81 between? Between 55 and 89. Do we care about the 89 part anymore? No, we only needed the 89 part just to make sure that D was not going to include the, the number right before the 55. So we really don't need this number anymore in these calculations. We just need the one on this side. All right, so 81 and 55, what is D? 26. D is 81 minus 55, which is 26. All right, so our Zeckendorf representation for 81 is going to be the Zeckendorf representation of 26 plus 55. Well, what's the Zeckendorf representation for 26? Well, we have to come over here. We have a new K, right? The K prime. K is 26. Where is 26? Right, the next smaller Fibonacci number is 21. So what is the new D? Twenty-six minus twenty-one D is five, and so our second dwarf representation for twenty-six is second dwarf representation for D plus twenty-one, which is five plus twenty-one. Take that back here, and our second dwarf representation for eighty-one is five plus twenty-one. plus 55. Does that make sense? So let's pick any number you like. Any number you like, we can go through the process, right? We can do this process. We don't know the value here. This might have to feed back even further. But like we talked about before, rather than working our way back down with all of this uh, recursion, we can start building these values up as we go and using the ones that we need to go to the, to the next position and the next position. Does that sort of make sense? Okay, now the uniqueness part of this uh, we'll, we'll hold off on just a little bit. Let's think about what this possibly might have to do with playing our game with the piles of pebbles. In playing our game, well, for, before we do that, are we okay with this? Could we write a program to do this? Yeah. Good, because that's what you get to do for your next lap. Um, so, so what do we do? Take a number and create this representation. Now, why do we care about this representation? For one hand, we said, you know, I've already set it up that it's it's useful for. Uh, analyzing this game, but this game by itself is not all that interesting beyond this. I mean, I guess it's kind of fun to play, but after we know how to win, then it's kind of boring. Um, but it also turns out that the binary version of this, we can represent, say, uh, letters using a binary version of this. It's called a Fibonacci uh, encoding or Fibonacci coding. And rather than needing eight bits for every character, we can use fewer bits for a lot of characters. And so rather than needing as many bits, we can do a version of this and encoding numbers uh, according to this Fibonacci coding, and then be able to, to do a compression without losing any information at all. all right, so the, the, the Fibonacci coding uh, corresponds to looking at how likely certain letters are. What's the most likely letter in the in, in the English language? The most common letter? Probably a vowel. Yeah. Probably A. I guess A. So say those again. R S 
R, S, T, L, and E. And if a vowel is most common, then E would be the most common vowel. And it is the most common vowel. And T is the most common letter after that. Um, and so there's an order of which letters are most likely, and the encoding involves which letters are most likely. So what happens? When letters are l less likely, we will have more characters. And when, so when they're less likely, you have more characters. When they're more likely, you have fewer characters. So for instance, E is just one one in that encoding. So the encoding corresponds really closely to this Zeckendorf representation, except the second one, if you see two ones in a row, that means that the letter has ended. And so you see two ones, and that means that this letter character has ended. We'll go into this detail just a little bit later. Um, so you can see how that works, but it's based on this idea of this second dwarf representation. And then what it does, an E, instead of needing eight bits, just needs two. So if it ends with the consecutive ones, uh, does it have to have a zero to start another No. Row? So it could have three ones in a row. Yeah, so you could have three ones. Uh, no, 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 you, will, you can't have three ones in a row. Because if, if, if it's terminated because by the, three ones. the consecutive ones will signify the end of something. So you, so you can't have a one right before that, because then the letter would have ended here. As soon as you run into two ones, the letter has ended. So, but, you, but that next one, though... Oh, so yeah, the next one could be part of the next yeah, letter. Yeah, okay, yes. The next, but in that letter itself, you wouldn't get consecutive ones until the very end of it. But yes, you could have consecutive ones here, and then the first letter be another one. So you could conceivably get four ones in a row, but what would that correspond to? If there wasn't anything before that, that would be an E, and that would be an E. You could even have like that with something over here, say a word that ended in EE. -E would have that at the end of it. Are there any words that end in E-E? E? B. Yeah, B, right? Oh. Um, tree. Well, that's not three letters. Tree. Well, there could be something else over here. There. Tree ends in. So there are words that end in. So you could have that going on. But as soon as you run into two ones, that letter ended and a new letter starts. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But the idea is that we're not just doing things that are purely mind-boggling mathematics, right? It's there's 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 other applications and other uses that are useful for us in terms of if you represent things in a different way, then what would that do? You could send you could compress a message, for instance. Now what kind of what happens when you compress from the eight bits down to this? Again, there's no error correction. If there's an error, then you get the wrong letter. But there's no error correction in regular in that, in that encoding anyway, right? And going to the ASCII to binary, there's no, there's no error correction in that. If you mess up a bit, you get the wrong character. Um, so anyway, we'll come back to that. What happens as far as our game is concerned? As far as our game is concerned, How many should you pick up from the pile? Let's say that there are 81 pebbles in the pile. Eighty-one is five plus twenty-one plus fifty-five. The number of pebbles you should pick up is that number. 
turns out that in exploring this game, that what you want to do is write down the Zeckendorf representation and take the smallest number in the Zeckendorf representation. Now, we're not going to have time to completely analyze this game and to come up with that and see how somebody figured that out. That's what I don't know. Um, but let's, we, can, we can test it. All right? So let's test it with, with 81. So if there's 81 pebbles in the pile, the claim that I'm making is that I want to take away five. So if I take away five, how many are left? There are 76 left. I should have used a much smaller number. Uh, so, uh, so 76. Now, if my claim is correct, it doesn't matter what you do at this point. I'm still going to be able to win. But 76 is what in terms of a Zeckendorf representation? Say it again. Right, it's 21 plus 55 because we just took away the 5. Can you take 21? No. Because I only took 5. So you can only take to up to how many? You can only take up to 10. So you can't take the 21 that you need in the in the from the Zeckendorf representation. But if that person doesn't take one, can you only take two in the next turn? Okay, so you take, you want to take one? Yeah. All right, so we're at 75 now, right? Well, what's the Zeckendorf representation for 75? Well, it's going to be the Zeckendorf representation for 20 plus 55. And what does 20 look like? Two plus five plus 13 plus 55. What can I do? I can take the two. So I will take the two. That puts us at 73. Anytime they would mess it up, you just have to recalculate. You have to recalculate every time. Every time. Right? At every new value, you have to recalculate. Does that make sense? So what happens? You're at 73. So what is your what is the Zeckendorf representation? It's 5 plus 13 plus 55. Can't take five. But you can't take 5 because you can only take up to 4. Make sense? So every time I can take the smallest value, you can't. Right? You, you write down the Zeckendorf representation and you can't take that many. Whatever you do, I recalculate and I can. I can take that value. Back and forth, back and forth. What's going to happen at the end of this? I can keep doing that, and you can check it out. Whoever went first will win this game. Okay? What would happen if we started on a Fibonacci number? Yeah, because the first player is going to mess it up, but the second player then can take advantage of of the second draft representation instead. So if you start with a Fibonacci number of pebbles, player two wins. But if you start without a Fibonacci number of pebbles, player one always wins. So you couldn't just take that Fibonacci number that you're on there? No, because you can't take all of them from the beginning. Now the only there would be a difference if you only had one or two pebbles, right? Now, actually no, even then, um, well, if you had one pebble, you can't fly. Because player one can't take everything. If you had two pebbles to start with, then player, two can win. player two still wins because player one can't take all of them. If you had three pebbles to start with, player two still wins. Player two still wins. If you had five pebbles to start with, then player one has to make it one, two, three, or four. And we've already shown that in all those situations, the other player wins. Right? So that idea of starting with a Fibonacci number, player two will win. Start with not a Fibonacci number, 
player one will win because four, player one has a way to win if they leave it at four. Uh, no, let's see, if they start at four, player one has a way to win. If you leave it at four, you lose. But if you start at four, you win. So if you have, if you started with a certain amount of number and then player two, uh, let's say it was like, if the number was 13 and then I took five, that would leave you with eight. Doesn't that kind of put you in the same position then? Well, if we started at 13 and you took five, leaves me with eight, what would I do? You would just clear the board. I would just clear the board, right? So you wouldn't play that on, well, again, that's me, me as player two and I win, right? So, um, so as player two in that, in, that, in that situation, it still means player two has the advantage. What if we started at 13? And you only took one. Puts it at 12. Uh, DR4 plus 8. Say it again. DR4 plus 8. And for 4 is? 1 plus 3. 1 plus 3 plus 8. So I'm going to take 1. And that puts us 11. at 11. Whatever you do, you can't. Can you take three? No. I no. Take two or one. You can take one or two. So if you take one, that puts us at ten. Mm -hmm. And what do I do? I take two. That puts us at eight. We're at eight. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? You can only t you can take one, two, three, or four. Mm -hmm. four. So you drop it to four on your turn. Yeah, and then you have to do the math. And then I say, well, four is one plus three, so I leave it at three. And you lose. And you can only take one or two, mm -hmm. right? So what happens? It really does work, and you can test it, and it really does work. What can we see from the proof part? We can see from the proof part um, that if player one takes this value, player two can't take what's left as the next smaller Zeckendorf number. So you can't go from taking the smallest Zeckendorf number to being able to also take the next smallest. So they do alternate. Um, the proof that it actually gets you to where you want to get to, you have to think about that a little bit. But again, that's kind of an aside from where we are. right? The idea is that this representation turns out to solve that game, which we actually then end up calling Fibonacci num for that purpose because it's related to the Fibonacci numbers. But um, it also then has this connection to being able to encode characters in a more efficient way to save on the overall file size uh, of, of the characters. Did we ever go over uh, num2 and 3? Not yet. All right, now what else happens? We still have left out the uniqueness of this, that there's not two ways to do that. All right, once you write down a representation, that there aren't two ways to write down uh, that same representation. So let's do take a look at the uniqueness part um, for, for just a minute. How do we know that the representation is unique? Well, let's suppose that it's not and see what happens. All right, if it's not unique, then n has two different representations. So there's two different sets that give us the same sum. Right? Two different sets of Fibonacci numbers that give the same sum. Right? 
to focus on two of them. So let's say S and T are two different sets, or sets of two different Fibonacci, um, well, let's say two different Fibonacci sets that correspond to these representations. And they, but they have the same sum because they're both representing the number n. Now, when we say they're distinct, that doesn't mean that they're completely different. S and T might have some overlap. So we could have S like this, and T might be like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to throw away the overlap. We're going to create a new set. We'll call it S prime. What is S prime going to be? S prime is going to be the part that's in S that's not in T. So we use this notation, although that's not the necessarily the best notation for that, but we said, but which, what does this really correspond to? This corresponds to throw away the intersection of S and T. And then we say, let's do the same thing with T. So S prime is over here, and T prime is over there. What do we know about the sum of S prime and the sum of T prime? If you add all these numbers together, and you get the same thing as adding all those together, and you throw away the crosshatch numbers, what happens? This sum is still the same as that sum. Right? If you have two sets of numbers, and this sum is the same as the bigger sum, and from both of those sums, you subtract the same amount, then the new sums are still the same. So you could say the sum of the values in set SI. All right, so this would be for all the Fibonacci numbers in S prime. Excuse me, I said SI. Um, the sum of all the Fibonacci numbers in the set S prime is equal to the sum of all the Fibonacci numbers in the set T prime. Maybe we use a different letter there. You get, yeah, as soon as I wrote that down, I thought I should have changed that. Um, okay, so the sums were the same before. You threw away the same numbers from both sets, and so the new sums are still the same. Well, what happens? If these are not the same set, then there are values that are different. The largest Fibonacci number in S prime is some number that we're going to call f sub s. We just call it that. The largest Fibonacci number Something I don't get when you make proofs and stuff, like I don't always get why you make certain decisions as you do. Like in this case, how do you know that to just take the largest number? Well, let's see what happens with um, – so what happens when, with proofs is it's always after they're done – the proofs aren't written forward. Proofs are written by experimentation and working and then going back and filling in the pieces. So once we have this, then we'll talk about why we made that choice.
So this is a little bit of magic right now. Yeah. And then we'll talk about why we made that choice. So do you agree that there is a largest number uh, in S prime and then a largest number in T prime? Yeah. Right? Because these are these non-empty sets that we're looking at. What happens if we had thrown everything away? If we had thrown everything away, then S and T were the same. So what's going to happen? There is a biggest Fibonacci number in S prime. There is a biggest Fibonacci number in T prime. And then there might be others, right? S prime has other numbers in it. T prime has other, or, yeah, T prime has other numbers in it. But over here in S prime, there is a biggest value. And in T prime, there is also a biggest value. Now, we know what happens if you add alternate Fibonacci numbers. But let's see what happens if you add all of the Fibonacci numbers um, in one sequence and compare it to something else. OK, so before we go any further, let's just suppose uh, for convenience that fs is less than ft. It might be the other way around, but it, one of them is bigger, right? One of these two numbers is bigger because they're not equal. So let's just suppose it's, a, it's, it's called without loss of generality. One of these numbers is smaller than the other one. And let's just say it's s because that's the alphabetical order. All right? So one of those two numbers is smaller. So, so we'll come back to that in just a second. Let's do an, an aside here. Let's actually, what's going to happen if we add up these non consecutive values? We've already seen that this is the next one minus one, right? What if we had something like this? Well, actually, I was thinking of the sequence, right, the binary like this. What does that correspond to? That corresponds to 1 plus, corresponds to 1 plus 5, which is 6. Which is less than what? The next slot would have been the Fibonacci number 8. That's the number of zeros. Um, like how many well, so what's the idea here? Let's, uh, let's pick a non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers. If we pick non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers and we take the biggest possible sums that we can have, what's the biggest possible sum we can have from non-consecutive numbers? We can do something like this or something like this for the non-consecutive. And what always happened in both of those situations? We were still the next Fibonacci number minus 1. Right? What would happen if we put two of these kind of together, where you had something and then had, had a couple of zeros in a row? Before you went on, then would it be even smaller, right? So what happens if you add up a bunch of non-consecutive Fibonacci numbers? That total sum, and we can prove this, but that total sum is going to be less than the next Fibonacci number. Does that make sense? 
Right? So if you do the best possible thing, you still come up one short. If you left some of those ones out or move things around, you're going to come up even shorter. All right? So let's take a look back here then. S prime. Its biggest Fibonacci number is F sub S. T prime, its biggest Fibonacci number is F sub T. And F sub S is less than F sub P. So what happens if we add up all of the values in I guess that's probably the notation we should have used for that, right? Add up all the Fs that are in that set. So this is the sum of the things from the set S prime. What do we know about that sum? That sum is less than sum of T prime. It's less than that single value by itself. Make sense? Because this whole sum of things in S prime will be less than the next Fibonacci number after F sub S. So actually, we could say this. Uh, well, we don't know what the S corresponds to. It's not a, it's not an index in that case, right? It's just the Fibonacci number that corresponds to the set S prime. But this. This value is less than that one. So you add up all of these Fibonacci numbers that are in here, because they are gapped apart, they're non-consecutive, that sum is going to be less than this. And what do we know about this value? This value is inside the set T prime. So the sum of all of those things is at least F sub T. Because F sub T is part of that set. Might be equal, but it's probably bigger. It doesn't matter, right? It's, it's at least equal. So what happens? This means that the sum of S prime is strictly less than the sum of T prime. But they started off equal. And we threw away the equal things from both. And then we somehow got the sum being smaller, which means what? The only way we could have thrown things away and made that work is if we threw everything away. So in other words, we have a contradiction. If you start off with equal sets and you throw away the same thing from both sets, the sum should still be equal. But now the sums aren't equal, so that means we couldn't have done this to begin with. So what does that mean? That there aren't two different ways to write down a representation. There's only one way to write down the representation. All right, so why did we want to look at the largest values? Because with the largest values, we can get an upper bound on the sum of S prime and a lower bound on the sum of T prime. So we know that the sum of T prime turns out, in this situation, to have to be bigger than the sum of S prime, but it can't be, which means that S prime and T prime can't have anything in them, which means that you can't really have two different representations for a number. And there's some proofs in there. There's a lot of hand-waving because there's, there's more detail uh, in that. But what's the idea, first of all, that we always can write down a Zeckendorf representation? And not only that, but that representation is unique. And then it applies to the pebble game, and it applies to encoding uh, characters. We can use it to encode lots of things that will be a compression over the traditional kind of 8-bit uh, encoding of a, of, a, of a value. Okay. So that last part, then, you're not even saying, like, that's what's true. You're saying in order for that 
In order for those to be different, that would have to be Yes, different. right? In order for... If there were two dis different ways to write down the number, then this weird thing would happen. But this weird thing can't happen, so there can't be two ways to write down the number. Okay? So, I'm not going to ask you to prove any of that, but I will ask you to write a second order representation uh, function to be able to calculate the Zeckendorf representation. And then what could you do? Then you could incorporate that into a game player, right, that would play Fibonacci Nim against a player and would be able to be expert at the game, right? Win if it's possible and lose if, if there was no way to win, right? But still put in the best, you know, the best possible effort uh, in, terms of, in terms of winning the game. Yes? Thank you, Doug. Okay. So, uh, we want to take the, the time that we have, at least part of the time that we have left, uh, to answer any questions. About the uh, about the homework assignments. Let me go ahead and.